I think that don't look at the price. Forty five dollars will get lunch, um, brunch, but it's going to be wonderful praise and worship, and secondly, um, um, preaching. This is going to be good. Um, and she has number one done this herself without charging, and I tell her myself in a symposium to <laughs> charge. Okay? Um, people are not just giving out free information. And the information and the spiritual growth that you're going to receive from this symposium is worth $45. Now, you pay $45 if you take your grandchild, you, and two neighbors to McDonald's, you're going to spend $45. I'm serious. The, the, I was shocked. I said, I want four orders of the chicken McNuggets for a dollar. And the man replied, it's no longer a dollar. No, it's no longer a dollar. It's $155. Wow. Okay. Put a dollar. Only thing a dollar at McDonald's is a large drink. Everything else. All right, now. So I told them, okay, well, give me the four. Now, why get the four? Four times four is 16. Instead of ten, spending the $10 and they give you 10 pieces, I get the dollar times four, that means 16. You should have it. Yeah, you got to do the math. I do the math. Then you get the $3 bundle, they give you six. I get the four, I get what? Six. Do the math. No more fries. I'm, 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 Trying to stay, thank you. Trying to stay away from all that stuff. This week I changed uh, all of my, you know, my eating habits and stuff. Uh, tomorrow I'll see you Saturday. <laughs> tomorrow, you just can't go cold turkey right away. You can't. Your mind will play games. My mind was telling me about sweets, and I, I decided no. So I go. To try to find sherbet ice cream, sherbet, and I and I, and I found it. It was in the in the um, key food. I took it home and I made a lot in a big bowl, and the taste wasn't there. First, it was a non-brand name. <laughs> I said to myself, "This ain't real sherbet. What is going on? This is not." And I forgot the name of it. That's why I knew it. But really, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, changing dietary habits now. You have to exercise self-control. Very, very important. Now, Charles Spurgeon, um, Charles Spurgeon, you, you heard of Charles Spurgeon? Yes, yes, yes. He's a, he's a tremendous theologian. Uh -huh. All right? And um, he met with Moody, Moody from Chicago, mm -hmm. and when when Charles, uh, when Reverend Moody came into Charles Spurgeon's house, Charles Spurgeon had a cigar. And uh, Reverend Moody said to him, he said, how are you smoking that cigar, that sin? And he looked at Reverend Moody and said, but well, look at the size you are, uh -uh. and that sin also. Yes. Reverend Moody was overweight. And all Charles Spurgeon said, I may have this, but and you could sin by overeating, yes. being a glutton. Yes. You can't see nobody wanna deal with this. It's true. And then we we have huh? Get it twenty instead of ten. Seven instead of ten. But listen twenty. Yeah, but I didn't eat it. See, I, didn't, I never told you I ate that. I grew up that for my godson. Didn't I have 16? Chicken McNuggets don't even please me. That's the other part of the story. No, I, I promise it wasn't for me. It was for my godson and I got it. But, so don't be quick to judge people. That's the moral road we're coming from. Because we could be sitting unaware and don't know. Okay, you're a good group of good group of people. Can I get my glasses? 
Um, if I'd asked her, she would have said the baggage, right? <laughs> <laughs> She's not smiling, Chance. Uh, Y'all go put a smile on. They can't see you. We ain't on TV. They might even smile. All right, let's go to 1 Samuel 17, okay? This is where we're at. Who would you got? 1 Samuel 7. Yeah, we, we did that while you were here a couple of months ago. And Juan, so if you will be 17 now. You just want to come up to the front and get on the and put on Zoom, yo. Know? Seventeen. All right, now review, review. Hey, oh, I need my paper, my yellow sheet. Review. One of the things that we should be gleaning from the Old Testament, even though the Old Testament, when you study it. It is made up of types and patterns and shadows, right? But it was written. It, it, was, it was written for our example. And it, it, it's written for instructions for us so when you read it even though you're in the book of Samuel God is giving us historicity of the nation that he first chose to himself and so we need to glean from that historicity let's see what we should be gleaning from the book of Samuel one we should be gleaning the essentiality of prayer. How important prayer is. I pray today when we start rushing to get in the church just to pray. I pray for the day when you know the hour of prayer is here and guess what? You're disturbed because you were caught late in traffic jam getting the prayer. Because the only way that we're going to be able to talk to God is through prayer. And I want to share with you that in the book of Samuel, it initiates with prayer, and the center is prayer. And at the end is prayer. And God is saying, if we study this book, prayer should be essential to us. Now, not pray in any kind of way. We have to learn how to pray in the will of God and pray the scriptures. Don't care what people say. Don't care what people think. Pray the scripture. All right? Second thing, um, that we should be gleaning is the importance of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Now, whenever you talk about the kingdom of God and you understand it from the scriptures, it's really saying God wants theocracy. He really wants to govern our, our we want to govern us. He really wants to be our Lord and our Savior, theocracy. He says, you need me. You, I am absolutely imperative to you. And you need to understand that. I don't really need you, but you really need me. I'm absolutely necessary. I'm requisite. And that's what we've got to claim. I want to be Lord and Savior of your life. I want to be Lord. If I'm Lord, now you submit to me. If I'm Lord, you yield to me. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. So I come in, and guess what? All of the um, idiosyncrasies that I have, all the peculiarities that I have, all of the faults and flaws, he wants that on the altar. He wants a spiritual people. See, the, the, what Israel missed is that 
He always wanted a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual nation, and they missed it. He don't want us to miss it. Lord, save him. And then he wants us to know, I have men that I trust to give you a word to transform your life. Yes. Very important. Thank you, Jesus. Because if you don't believe in the man of God or the woman of God who's over you, you ain't never going to grow. He will never step down from heaven and grow you. Not when he put his word here and sent people to study the word so we can give examples. So it, it, it's something we should we should all glean. Number two, we should glean about we are all leaders. And um, there are three kinds of leaders. First, a leader that is making things happen. Okay? And so we, we're going to have family and friends there. That's making things happen. Okay? We're going to have a symposium making things happen. We're going out every Saturday, the evangelists in the community going out making things happen. But that is what leaders are supposed to do that's in the book. The second kind of leader is a leader that just sit back and watch things happen. That should be none of us. And the third leader is a leader that don't know what's happening. That should be none of us. This is what God is talking about leaders. Now he gave us an example of four leaders. Number one, the first leader he gave us an example of was Eli. Eli was the high priest. And Eli was a good high priest. But he was a poor father. And he did not correct his sons. Parenting is so important. I want to tell you, if you don't correct your children, they'll grow up to become disasters. And the kingdom, what we learned from that first priest, who, number one, was in charge of the sacrifices given to a God, the one who went into the holies of holies, once a year to make atonement for the people. And yet he's a good priest, but a horrible father. And his kingdom was taken over. We looked up a praying woman by the name of Hannah, who was barren, but who pressed away the church during the festivities and sat in there with a broken heart because she was teased. She was belittled. She was berated. Oh, man, if we learn anything, we got to stop berating and belittling people. And I want to jump on this. Stop playing with God. Now, you know how you play with God? <clears throat> After all the instructions that God gave me, I still hold something against Deborah. I don't tell any of you, but I will not go in her direction because I don't want to speak to her. Just went upstairs and stood before everybody and said, I apologize. And that's humility. But if you say it and don't do it, you're a hypocrite. And we learned that. Yeah, that, that number one, Hannah, her name means gracious because she couldn't bear children. Society said the finger of God is upon you. Because she couldn't bear children, Penina, her competition, because Elka and I have married two wives. That's why God said that's wrong. And uh, she chided her and belittled her. One of the things we should extrapolate when, well, first, love never holds a record of evil. Love is kind, and Penina was not kind. And so we find Hannah in the temple mumbling, and the priest Eli said, you drunk. Now, don't don't judge him real quick. Because 
it must have been a dilemma in the temple for him to say, you're drunk. And she said, oh, no. Look, she didn't get upset. You don't need to be upset when you're corrected. Because he that can receive chastisement, correction, rebuking, is a son or a daughter, and the rest is an asking. Put the be in front of That's what God says. That you can't accept correction. That you are illegitimate. Because every child must be corrected. And so she said, oh, no, my Lord, I'm barren. And the, he prophesied that. This is how good of a priest he was. It's this time next year, she produces a kid by the name of Samuel. Samuel was a judge. Samuel was a prophet. Samuel was an intercessor, and Samuel was a priest. Four, four offices. His mother, like you do it, I applaud you, brought Samuel and left him under the guidance of Eli to raise him up in the temple. Before she thought about sending him to a private school, before she thought about giving them brand name clothes, all the things we do, and there's nothing wrong with that, she wanted her son spirituality. Because she believed the Bible, if you train them up in the way it should go, when they get old, they won't depart. And he, she raised this guy up, and he became the first of the prophets and the last of the judges. And the Bible said he governed Israel all the days of his life with perfection, but missed out with his sons. Good leader, though. And the time of, we're reading, it's the time of um, the judges. It's anarchy. Now, anarchy is when everybody has an opinion, everybody follow the opinion, and everybody do that which is right in their own eyes. That's anarchy. Can't, that can't happen in church. What kind of church would we have if everybody in here did that which was right in their own eyes? We wouldn't have an authentic church. And so the, 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 the God, theocracy, wanted to govern because he knew that anarchy is going to lead you to guess what? non discernment you're going to start looking at other nations. You're going to take your eyes off of me and I'm going to let those nations listen to me. A very important point, destroy you. You divorce me. You walk away from me. And I'll put you in slavery. And that's what God did in the judges. He sent a nation, the Moabites, the Amorites, the, 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 the um, um, Amalekites. He kept sending nation after nation to punish them for decades. Because they rejected him. So anarchy, God says, I don't want that in church. Shows how it, when, when we are united, it shows our sagacity. When we eradicate the flesh, it shows our spirituality. All right? And uh, he put us before, guess what? Great people. Great people. All right? So you could boast about your God. Samuel. And then we had Saul. He was not a good leader. And uh, he did two things wrong and God rejected him. It's amazing. One, the first one he did, he operated in weakness. He made sacrifices before going to war. And he was not supposed to. The so priest was the only one, as I told you before, that could bring offerings to God. And he did it, and God rejected him. 
And then the second time uh, he was going to war, uh, God told him to wipe out the Amalekites. He saved Agag, the king. And God said, I reject you because you rejected my word. The second time was disobedience. What am I saying? If you understand where we're at, if you, number one, don't follow God's word, it leads to weakness. Weakness. And once the devil gets you weak, then he'll play in your mind. Hey, oh, why not go to church anyway? I'm going to look when some people say, I'm going to get beat up anyway. Before they get here, they think they're going to get beat up. You can talk about two and a half hours of the word, and you say one negative thing, and they say, see, it's quite good. Weakness will play on your mind. And then weakness will lead to disobedience, and God will reject you. So here's what God said we get in the lesson. He says, watch the spirit of rebellion. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Before I show out, I'd rather walk out the church and cry. Before I show out, I'd rather call you later and say, oh, let's get this right. But you want to be rebellious? He says, it's like the spirit of witchcraft. Yeah. Only one person did witchcraft here, right? Mm -hmm. Only one. Mm -hmm. We won't call out. Mm -hmm. Don't hear a whip. <laughs> she just got a red hat on. <laughs> And brown shoes. Because you had a red hat on too. <laughs> I'm not sure it was you, Carol, but I'm talking about some other person. Ain't that big witch fan? No, I said only one person in the whole church. She don't even know which fan. <laughs> and, and, and then he said, now, rebellion is. Like witchcraft, but then he said, disobedience is like adultery. Stubbornness is adultery. Idolatry, like you got a false god. So he says, I don't want the church wrapped up in that. No, should we? Let's go to 17 now. Okay? This is interesting. All right, first Samuel 17. Now please read it. And you gotta start. I, I'm learning that we're not being effective if we apply scripture to our lives. <clears throat> you know? You'll say, oh, it's just reading. You know. Mm -hmm. No, I ain't just reading. <laughs> All right, let's go. This is here we go tonight. Wonderful study. Now the Philistines gathered together their army to battle and were gathered together at Shokor, which belonged to Judah and pitched between Shokor and as Azekar as and Epheth Damon. Okay, now this, this is what's happening there. There was so war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. The Philistines are the arch enemies to Israel. And all of Saul's time, they came against Saul. All right, this, the Philistines were an, an inward. They were inward, for which is much uh, worse than an outward foe. They were an inward foe, the Philistines. Now, when you got an outward uh, foe, you know him. Dangerous is an inward foe. The church cannot have enemies within. We can't. We've got to understand that we are not each other's enemies. We may have different cultures and different ways we handle situations, and some are weak and some are 
are, 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 are strong. But listen, he said, let the weak and the tear, let them tarry together, because in the day of harvest, I'll do the separation. So we can't send people away. Even if they error, even if they come out wrong, even in the van, they come out wrong, you have a deacon, you have a chief evangelist who should just correct. But we can't dislike and show discord after you correct. And we go on the warpath because I'm going to share with you, we're not each other's enemies. we got a real enemy. And he's out to make us each other's enemy. Well, they had this inward enemy, all right? It was the Philistine, all right? Because Saul never did, okay, quite defeat the inward foe. Now, please, very important. At least conclusively, that inward foe would ultimately defeat him. Philistines, the arch enemy. Spiritually, it is the same presently. We must defeat our inward foe. Here's what God is saying. God is speaking to us tonight and saying, your worst enemy is not cattle. Your worst enemy is not your bishop. Your worst enemy is yourself. And you have to defeat the inward part that starts in your mind. Remember, he starts out with a thought and he'll turn a thought into an act. Remember, he'll turn an act into a habit where now I dislike folks and don't know why I dislike them. Or I dislike folks and guess what? My rationale for disliking them is ludicrous. It's ridiculous. I can't even figure out that. That, now, God is saying to us tonight, we got to watch out for this inward fault. This can be done only by believers placing their faith exclusively in Christ and the cross. That's a prayer, your esoteric prayer, not the prayer you come here with. The esoteric prayer, you need to start asking God to allow you to have exclusive faith in Christ and his cross because that's where victory comes over the flesh right victory over the flesh that's important if this is done the cross must not be eliminated or pushed aside because the Holy Spirit will not help us if we push aside the cross and push aside Christ. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elam and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now, in the, the valley of Elam, it had a center and to the right were mountains and to the left were mountains and what they would do the Philistines would take one side, all right, and the Israelites will take the second side, and then there will be the challenge in the valley. And watch the Philistines. They come with a giant by the name of Goliath. This is the fight. This is the fight. Now, and the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side to see it, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them, the valley of El uh, Elah. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He's eight feet and five inches tall. He's a giant. He's not only eight feet and five inches tall, I want to tell you he's strong. He's strong. He's a giant. He's strong. All right? Um, he, his armor 
the weapons and the armor that he has on are 150 to 200 pounds. I want you to know that when he stepped into the valley of Elah, it put fear in the sight of Israel. Because look at this giant. Look at his weapons. Look at his equipment. And above all, this guy was a champion. He knew how to fight. He hadn't lost the fight. And now he's coming to Israel. And when he gets to Israel, now he wants to fight him. So look, this means he was between eight feet, five inches, or nine feet. You do the math, it'll come close. All right? In a spiritual sense, this is exactly what believers face. You and I. All right? How do we face this? All right? We face this. To be sure, it is not possible for us to defeat such opposition within our power and strength. Here, you are not going to whip a giant. You are full in your own strength and with your own power. No, you're not going to whip them. We ain't wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities. All right? There is only one way it can be done. If we're going to whip these giants, that's overpowering. We're going to whip them. They're bigger than us. It's got to be done through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit tells us how to do it. Now watch. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head. And he was armed with a coat of a male. And the weight of the look, coat was five thousand shekels of brass, right? 125 to 150 pounds, all right? And he had graves, greaves of brass uh, upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver bee. And his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. At least the spearhead, the spearhead was 15 pounds. All right? And one, and one bearing a shekel went before him. Now listen. Hmm? Now, and one bearing a shield went before him. All right. The number six is an is a important number. It's stamped upon the lion. He was six cubic high. What did number six get for his man's number, right? And he had six pieces of armor counting the weapons. So the number six was stamped upon him, right? Six, six, six is a sign of what? The false prophet, false beast, all right? Just the devil himself, all right? If he if he is if, if he be able to fight, now look what he said, verse number eight. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not? Am not I a Philistine? And your you are and you are servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Frightening. If he is able, this is how they fought in, 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 in the in in in, in the uh, olden times, one on one. But whoever wins, they capture the nation. Listen, if he's able to fight and to kill me, then will we be your servants? But if I prevail against him and kill him then you be our servant and serve us. That's all the enemy wants you to do. Serve him. Serve him. And the Philistines said, I defy 
This is Goliath. The armies of Israel this day, give me a man that we may fight together. Now, the only fight that we should be fighting is the good fight of faith. No, never should Christians fight in a church. Never should Christians fight on the street. That ain't our character. We are to fight the good fight of faith. Not each other. Can't ever amount to that. And not to be saved. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Did he give us the spirit of fear? Love, power, and a sound mind. But look, it didn't work here. He's afraid. Why? Why are they afraid? In possibility, we all would have been. But why are they afraid? Of what they, are they are utilizing sight. They are dealing with a spiritual issue with physical ability. That's why we do the same thing. Baby. All right. When giants come into us, they say you got cats, and the first thing they might think, "Oh my God." Now, it gives a concern, but not fear. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So we got to learn, we can't look at something and just let it uh, cause us to go into a, a panic and go into fear. We can't hear the report. After hearing the report, what needs to come back to you is whose report will you believe? What is this? Because God has you on the ground just circling the airport and you haven't lived off yet. And you're sick and you think you're never going to get well. It's a giant baby. And you're looking at the giant with your natural sight and it plays in your head. I'm going to always be like Take a hold of courage. Yes. Take a hold of faith. Stand on the word of God. Announce now. You want to make the devil really mad? You want to give him an excruciating headache? Every day you get up and you feel the pain. You say, pain is not an indication that I am not healed. Because healing is not based upon what I feel. Healing is based upon what his word said. And he said he was wounded for my transgression, bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, and with his stripes I am healed. You got to say, I'm healed, even though you feel the pain. Yes. Yes. You're crying, but I, I'm healed. There's healing in the cross. Everything I need is in the uh, meritorious work of Jesus. Now, it'll play on your mind because you're looking with the eye gate and the eye gate says, I'm debilitating right before my eyes, but my faith says that I might be outwardly perishing, but inwardly I'm getting strong in the Lord. And I look the devil in the eye, and I look my condition in the eye, and I say I am healed by the meritorious work of Jesus. That's real faith. That's real faith. Now David was the son of Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. Now, interesting that David comes to play here. And one of the things we got to know about David, what do you think is the most imperative thing that the scripture is trying to extrapolate right here? It's, it's introducing David. What do you think? Well, all think together. It's dangerous. <laughs> What's the question? The question is why is God introducing David 
whole background right here. Why? Because I think that he's showing that right here is just what we read, that he's an ordinary man. He's laying the foundation that he's an ordinary person, but God is going to use an ordinary person to accomplish extraordinary things. Okay, that's good. What do you think? Because um, David is going to get into like a lot of sinning, but that sinning is not going to define who he is. Okay, you really extrapolate. Now you're interfering in the text. Because it ain't about sinning there. No, and that's okay. I want this because you can impose your own judgment in the text. And, and yes, go ahead. You're next. Yes. David, David was a man after God's own heart. One, he's a man after God's own heart. But even before being a man after God's own heart, what is he? You know how to and ask yeah, yeah, but if, see, you, you, if you throw that in here, you're interpreting something that's not here. But he, you already have some facts. Yeah, but that ain't, the, the thing is, he has been anointed by God. Now, you got to take the background, what you have. Don't, don't, right here, David is not committed to sin with anybody. No. So if you throw in sin, you're interpreting the text. You could say he's a shepherd boy. But what's imperative here is that God has elected him when his mama didn't think about it, his father didn't think about it, but God said, go and perform a sacrifice. Why? I want him anointed. Listen, here's what I see here. This David has been smeared with the oil. Yes. The Holy Ghost is upon day. What, 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 what I see here, his name means he's beloved by God. He's loved by God. He's the loved one. And that God is raising the loved one up to defeat his enemy. And I want to share with you, if you can interpret the text right, God is raising you up to defeat your enemy. Oh, the Bible said, He's, God was with him. That's the kind of stuff that you gotta have here. Because when you can look at that, then the lesson is God is with me. No matter what enemy I face, I've been called by God. I've got the oil that's smearing me, the oil that's running down my head. I am anointed. I'm not just smeared. The oil is rubbed all inside of me. It gets into my pore. It gets into my inner man. Not only is it being smeared and rubbed, but they all have been painted. I don't look like I look. I don't act like I was because now he is what? An anointed man of God. And he's a man after what? God's own heart. Now, you throw that in, and now you see a lot about baby. That's how you draw it in, and people say, where did, where did it come from? <clears throat> it came from previous readings. Previous chapters. That here's the guy, he's ready. What does ready mean? He's ready, but his eyes are in luminous. He's good looking, right? He's, 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 he's muscular, right? He's a man of courage. He's got a lowly position, but he's going to a high place. Amen. No matter where you start, it's how you end up. And so look at this guy, David, now. He's loved by God because he loves God. And, and here's what it was saying Saul. Wanted to be king. David made God his king. Saul lied about people. David had a love for people. Where did he get the love for people? Watching his father cheat. David was devoted. David was loyal. David was anointed. David was a spiritual man. David had, he could pray. How do we know he could pray? Psalm 51. Look at the book. Psalm 51. <laughs> Psalm 51. <laughs> what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visit? The guy could pray. You're not going to see my soul face corruption. The guy could pray. 
He's a worshiper. He knows how to worship. He's still on the harp. Now, now the harp was that big harp you see the orchestra. It was a layer. It was like a little guitar. And he could play it until demonic forces got off a song. That's what you bring in the days. Who taught him? Who taught David? Never since Jesse, his father was spiritual. What do you, what do you, now, now you can infer, I've already done it. His mama whispered things in his ear as a child about who God is. David's about 17 years old. His mama, his mama. Why? Because that is what mother's supposed to do. And he couldn't come to know God by himself. Somebody was putting substance and a source in him to believe God. Do you see when God told him, God said, the reason why he's a man after my own heart, first he's anointed. But second, he has a believing heart. The fool have said in his heart, there's no God. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the flood. He knows God. The worshiper. He's a praiser. He don't wait for nobody to praise him. He didn't wait for a praise team to come. He knew how to have service by himself with the word. Okay? So 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 now you got him. Eight sons. New beginning. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three uh, eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. Now here's Saul. Saul's going to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next after him, Abinadad, and uh, the third Shammah. And David was the youngest. And the three elders followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. That is important. You always will find David on assignment of his father. He's loyal to the assignment. Hear God, hear God. You have to be loyal to this assignment to death. Amen. You gotta be faithful, you gotta be devoted till death. And if they I'm the armor bearer, he's an armor bearer of the king. Now, when you put an armor bearer, right, you put your life in their hands. It's the armor bearer who carried the weapons of the king. It's the armor bearer who would go first. It's the armor bearer who would taste food first. Drink the wine first. Let me sip it. Because if I die, you'll still live. The armor bearer. Armor bearer. Look, look, God is asking, are you a committed, faithful armor bearer? Well, I don't just read this to read it. This Old Testament, but God is asking some questions. Are you committed to prayer? Are you committed to God? Are you committed to church building it? Are you holding the grudge and holding evil? It ain't love. Oh, look at this guy. He goes back to his father's sheep uh -huh, at Bethlehem. Now, he's already played the harp and Saul, the evil spirit, goes away from Saul. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and pressed himself 40 days. 40 days this giant went in the valley and said the same thing over and over. Come on, give me a man. Give me a man. Isn't it interesting that Saul didn't come out? He's the king, right? He, he, he had the, the highest stature of all of the men and he doesn't come out. Saul, yeah, Bible says he's afraid. 
afraid to die. What the scripture says, when you're afraid to die, what happens? If you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. If you give your life, you're saved. Number 40 is important here. It's a test. See what drops out? The Bible is a test. All right. Remember. Now, and Jesse said unto David, his son, take now for your brethren an effort of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brethren. And carry these ten uh, cheeses unto the captain of, of their thousand. And look how your brethren feel. Tell me. And take the pledge. You know. Look at how. Uh, 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 this is. He, and Saul. And now Saul and they. And all the men of Israel. Were in the valley of Elam. Fighting with the Philistines. Now, now it's not heavy fighting. Mm -mm. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper. Again, look how he takes care of God's sheep. It's all this business. I got to go, but leaving you in care with who? With the sheep. Watch it. All right. Mm -hmm. And the one that had commanded him, and he came to the trench that the host was going of forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against armies. Now, David, and David left his carriage and stuff in, in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brother. And as he, David, talked with them, uh, behold, there came up the champion. The Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. Yeah. Here's the challenge. Yeah. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up again? Look at that eye gate. You see him? Eyes can be deceived. Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king, will enrich him and great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine? And takes away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, this David knows something. He knows his God is bigger than a giant. David knows something. He knows his God is the living God. Right? That every God that exists is a pseudo God. Yes. There's only one authentic, real, living God, and that's Jehovah. So now, David, look, look, look. You got to know, you got to have some facts. Yes. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. And Eliab and his elder brothers heard when he spoke unto the men, and Eliab angered. Kindled against David. And he said, why did you come here? And with whom have you left uh, those few sheep in the wilderness? Huh? A mean, a sarcastic. Right? He won't fight them. I know, I, I know your pride and the anguish of your heart. For you are come down that you might see the battle. Wow, man, with contempt. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? That's good. Oh, that's a great title. Yes. I want to ask you, is there not a cause? Uh -huh. When people 
over one wow. million people in America died from corona. Mm. One million and five hundred thousand contacted corona. I asked the church, is there not a cause? Many of those people who died, no one could get to the hospital to witness to them. They couldn't be very proud. Is there not a cause when we look in our streets and we see crime going on unbelievably? You know, is there not a cause? They said to me, the last press conference I went to, they said, uh, oh man, he's angry at the police. Why? And uh, the Lord just gave me, um, hey, we're going to fight the battle. More police got to be in the street. And guess what? So the big wheels went to one police plaza. Some genius heard it because we're going to do this here. Put more police officers in the street in the troubled areas. I called Judge, not Judge, um, 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 Chief Harris. And I told her, she said, oh, no, 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 no. That's a great suggestion. And the police department adopted it. Is there not a cause? Of course there is. We have to get sick of seeing kids gunned down. We've got to get, we have to be sick of some idiot who will steal a wheel of a scooter from a 90-year-old man, 95 years old. We've got to get sick of being angry at each other and treat each other in any kind of way and not love it. There is a cause. When the church is not displaying the mind of Christ, there's a cause. When we are not together and unified, there's a cause. But the biggest cause is to snatch people out of hell and start filling up heaven. Uh, we on an assignment. Oh, there is a cause. All right. All right. Now. And when the words were heard, which David spoke, look, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. Now look, Saul, Saul's a real coward. You know? He sent for David. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Don't go. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Boy. This is tremendous faith. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the, this Philistine uh, to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. Right? In the natural, Saul is correct. In the spiritual, there's no contest. Physically, David's a boy. Don't have the strength nor the power to deal with this man. But spiritually, David knows something. He's anointed. And David said unto Saul, Your servant kept his father's sheep, and they came the lion and the bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smoked him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by the Beard, wow, and smote him, killed him. When God says he's with you, when God says he's with you, he is. He ain't gonna lie. Your servant killed both the lion and the deer, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be one of them, seeing he has defied the armies. Of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go! And the Lord be with you. <laughs> and Saul armored David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David curdled 
his sword upon his armor, and he is swayed to go, for he had not proved it. Uh -huh. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with you. These, for I have not proved them. And David put, put them off him. Uh, the flesh is always trying to get victory. David had to separate his flesh from his spirit to win this battle. That's what God is saying to us tonight. We're going to have to separate our flesh from the spirit. If we're going to feed our giants, or we'll stay the same. You'll never be like Jesus. You'll know of him, but never be really close to him and like him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five stones, five small stones. What a man. Out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, uh, which he had, even in the script. And his sling was in his hands. And he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that fought the shield went before him, before Goliath. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and running and of a fair continent. And the Philistine said unto David, I am a dog. That you come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. So he fought. Then said David to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Now what does that mean? Now, now your study should get back Shabbat. into you. Jehovah Sabbath. What does it mean? Remember Sabbath. It means he's ready to go to war on your enemies. So David used the name. It means that guess what? I'm going to give you service now. I'm going to bring the enemy to you. And you're going to serve the enemy. You're going to defeat the enemy because I'm the God of the host of heaven, but I'm the God of the host of the armies on the earth, and there's nothing that can defeat me. As long as you have faith in the God who is living, and know that that God is with you, and use the name of that God, your enemies are going to be destroyed every single time. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. The enemy's bigger than you. But not bigger than your God. The enemy has more power than you, but not more power than that is within you. So look. One verse on Bishop. So how could it be so powerful in any Look at 46. Why are you doing that to me? Come on, Bishop. Where are you? Okay, she, she's on 46 with us. 46. All right, this thing will the Lord deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you. Look at this. Look, he makes his boast in the Lord, and the humble hear thereof, and be made glad. Look, 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 look. And I will give the caucus of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God. Is there God in the good, good time. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saved not with sword and spear, right? Right, right, listen. Uh, uh, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, said the Lord. So it ain't with sword and spear. Look at this. Uh huh. And, uh, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Yes. David is so wow. a brave guy. Came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hasted and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. Now that's faith. Wow. That's faith. He doesn't, faith never retreats, faith always marches forward. All right? Faith 
will never run from, faith runs towards. And David put his hand in his bag, yeah. took the stone and slung it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon the, uh, his face to the earth. Wow. Do you know what this is a type of? This is ultimately a type of Jesus defeating Satan. I think David is David, and Jesus is the son of David. All right. And, and, and so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine. Uh huh. Uh, and took his sword, the sword of the spirit, and drew it out of his sheath thereof, and killed him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until you come to the valley and the gates of uh, the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sherem, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned uh, from chasing after the Philistines, then they spoiled their tents. When God destroys your enemy, then guess what? Your enemies will flee even when they come to you and they'll give you encouragement that in the next battle I can pursue it again with the same formula. And David took the head of the Philistines and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistines, he said, Come, Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this you, and Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I cannot tell. The king said, inquire. Now, wasn't he playing for the king? He's playing the harp for him. How can he? So I'm not knowing. Mm -hmm. And the king said, inquire you with uh, whose son uh, this uh, stripling is. And David returned from the sword of the Philistine. Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, you young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Well, God wants to defeat our enemies. Not only defeat them once, but every time the enemy shows up, God wants us to defeat them. But the battle is not physical. The battle is spiritual. You're never going to defeat them without the Holy Ghost. You're never going to defeat them without depending on the cross. You're not going to defeat them if we're not in the world. And so today, the Lord is saying, take courage. The Lord is saying, the battle is in your if it's sickness, that could be an enemy. If it's um, um, a poverty, that can be an enemy. Mm. If, it's, if it's an attitude or disposition or way of thinking, all of those things can be an enemy. But Jehovah's the boss says, I can defeat all of your enemies. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to God. Thank you. He's the living God of Israel, but he's the living God of the church. And today, he says, I have chosen you like I chose David. I have anointed you as I anointed David. I have given you the oil that's permanently dwelling on the inside of you, and David's was upon him. And I'm still fighting battles. I'm still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we can live a victorious life if we can grab a hold of faith, grab a hold of courage, get into the Word, 
change our mentality when the crisis comes. When the situations come, and they will give it to Jehovah Sabbath. Amen. Tell him the battle is not mine. The battle belongs to you. And so whatever bear you're fighting against, whatever lion you're fighting against, whatever giant you're fighting against, greater is he that is in you that he gets in the world. So God put this lesson in here for us to grab a hold of what David had. The anointing. God was with him. Faith. Courage. Right? Man after God so long. He loved God. God was his king. So tonight, we want to pray. God, be our king. God, we stand on the word that these giants, these crises, these grandiose dilemmas, the bears, the giants, the lions, we are going to be like David. We will not retreat. We're running forward. And we are giving it over to you. And as we give it to you, we look for the results. Cut the head off of our giants. Let us pick our giants up in our hand. Give us courage, God. Help us not to depart out of the book of the law. And in this book, help us to meditate on it day and night. I pray, God, for courage, but I pray for faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we said that you are the only true and living God and you are the God of the church. And we are standing in faith and we're standing in an anointing and say the enemy is already defeated and every problem, every giant, every crisis, every critical situation is under our feet and we're going to stop on the devil and continue to give him an excruciating headache because the just shall live by faith. And Father, today I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that you would so anoint us and let it me and let it rub into us. I pray, God, that it will be the spirit of truth. It will be a guide. It will help us. It will pray and intercede for us. And that every problem and trouble that we face, we will stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I thank you because the battle is already won. I thank you because we are people that are already victorious. I thank you because you're living and reigning us. I thank you because no weapon form against us shall be able to prosper. I thank you because the word has went out uh, and it cannot return to void. Uh, we are victorious. Uh, we are not victims, we're victors. Uh, and no weapons coming against us shall prosper. Uh, I tell the word uh, that we're going to be patient, uh, that we're going to wait on the Lord, uh, that there be no schism in this house, uh, that there be no slander in this house, uh, that there be no disharmony in this house, uh, that there be no hatred in this house. Uh, Say to the Lord, God rebuke you. Uh, you are under our feet. Uh, we are not people of envy. Uh, we are not people of jealousy. Uh, we are anointed. Uh, and the anointed did destroy the oath. Uh, we have the mind of Christ. Uh, we are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's burning out of us. Uh, every bit of flesh. Uh, it's washing out of us. Uh, every bit of the revenue. Uh, it's controlling our flesh. Uh, our flesh is submitted uh, to the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, our emotions are intact. Uh, For me and I, my house, uh, uh, we're going to serve the Lord. Uh, uh, we're going back to revival. Uh, uh, we're going back to the fundamentals. Uh, uh, we're going back to the Word. Uh, uh, we can't live by bread alone. Uh, uh, but every word that proceeded uh, 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 out the mouth of God, uh, uh, we stand on the Word. Uh, uh, we won't depart from the law. Uh, uh, we you created it with a clean heart. You renewed it with the right spirit. We stand on the word that we shall not be moved. We stand on the word that we're going to fast. 
fast uh, and pray uh, and we're running uh, to destroy our enemy. Uh, we stand on the word uh, that is God before us. Uh, who can be against us? Uh, we stand on the word uh, that you are mediator uh, for our loved ones uh, that are not saved. Uh, intervene. Uh, save the son. Uh, save the daughter. Uh, save the husband. Uh, save the wife. Uh, send back the backslider. Uh, add to the text. Uh, we see the cause. Uh, yes, there are the cause. Uh, a cause for righteousness. Uh, we see the cause. Uh, a cause for the anointed. Uh, a cause for holiness. Uh, a cause for God to fight. Uh, Come on, Jehovah. Uh, fight for us. Uh, Come on, Jehovah. Uh, live with us. Uh, Come on, Jehovah. Uh, we got permanency. Uh, we
I'm serving you people. Help us to get home safely. Thank you for their courage, for their faith and stamina. Continue to do good work in them. Thank God, in you and in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. Let's bring up your offering for the night and we thank God. Read one another. Read one another. Let's learn to do it. Let's learn to read people. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank